Now, let's get the obvious out of the way. Yes, this technically isn't a video game, but at the same time, it's still a critical part of Xenosaga media. So, for today, let me bend the rules for my Xeno spin-off saga as I dive into the 2006 web series Xenosaga 2-3, A Missing Year. Now just a reminder that videos like these are brought to you by my lovely patrons like Cameron Strauss and Echolocation. For as little as 3 Australian dollars a month you can get your name shouted out at the start of every Xeno Sanctum video as well as access to bonus behind the scenes content, link in the description below. As I have previously mentioned in what feels like every one of these Xeno Saga spin-off videos, Xenosaga Episode 2 had a ton of scrap content due to the changes made by the development team. As previously mentioned, a bunch of this content would be used in the Nintendo DS remake Xenosaga 1 Plus 2 and the mobile spin-off game Xenosaga Pied Piper. However, a large chunk of the game's original plot still remained unadapted. Meanwhile, at the same time, it was becoming very clear that the upcoming Xenosaga Episode 3 was going to be the last game in the series. With Xenosaga Episode 3 set to wrap up the whole series, Xenosaga creator Tetsuya Takahashi was keen to get the still unadapted content out to the public, as it contained key details of the state of affairs going into the third game. However, with minimal time before the final episode's release, there'd be no way to put this content into a game. Thus, the team had no choice but to bundle together a series of webcomics which they could release online in 2006 to bring fans up to date before they dived into Xenosaga Episode 3. While this format might be considered tacky, the release of what would come to be known as Xenosaga 2-3 A Missing Year would actually work as promotional material for Episode 3, with fans eagerly watching each episode as the comic as it built up to the final Xenosaga game's release. Due to the budget format release, no official attempt would be made to localise the webcomic into English. Instead, the events of a missing year would be put into a monologue near the start of Xenosaga Episode 3. Alongside this, the player could also find in-game data entries which reference events which happened in the webcomic. Not too long after Xenosaga Episode 3's release, Bando Namco would take down Xenosaga in missing year with it having served its promotional purpose. Thankfully, before this, the following team that you are seeing on screen right now would successfully download all six parts of the webcomic, translate them into English, and then re-upload them to YouTube, which is what I'll be using to make my retrospective. Now, being a webcomic with no real gameplay to speak of, I'm going to actually recap the whole story, rather than doing my usual coverage of the game's opening hours. Xenosaga A Missing Year was released in six separate chapters, and I'll try to do my best to recap each chapter individually. Chapter 1, which is also the shortest chapter, is mostly an introductory chapter. Here we meet Shion shortly before the events of Xenosaga Episode 3, explaining the events which got her to quit her job at Vector and join the rebel group Skintia. Following the events of Episode 2, Shion had returned to Vector but had grown concerned over the increase in Gnosis attacks around the galaxy. Recent attacks had seemed to be targeted at dense population centres, and rumours were spreading that the Gnosis were being controlled by someone. While Shion investigates the Gnosis attacks, her brother Jin gets involved in the investigation. Investigating the site of an attack, Jin finds a little female Reallian, who is referred to as Grimoire's little girl. He takes her back to headquarters to see if she has any information. Shion also decides to visit headquarters along with Cosmos, when she hears that the girl had mentioned the name Nephilim. As a result, Shion wonders if the Reallian has any relationship to the mysterious girl she keeps running into. Unfortunately, shortly after Xion arrives, the headquarters fall under an attack by the Gnosis. During the attack, an agent called Doctus shows up and kidnaps the girl while at the same time crippling Cosmos. While Cosmos goes into repairs, Chapter 2 sees Xion perform an investigation into the kidnapper, as well as an investigation into who exactly this Grimoire's little girl character is. She finds that the girl has certain links to the Lamageddon Project, which was first used back on Earth to summon the Gnosis. It was also the cause of Earth's disappearance to now be the land of Lost Jerusalem. The original developer of the Lamageddon Project was a scientist called Grimoire Verum, who Shion assumes had a relationship to the little girl, despite the fact that Grimoire most likely died thousands of years ago. 
With the research into Grimoire and his legacy bringing up more questions than answers, Xion and Jin decide to track down the kidnapper. They follow the kidnapper Doctus using special wavelengths emitted by the little girl to a battleship deep in space. The two sneak aboard but are soon found out by Doctus who captures them. In Chapter 3, Xion and Jin are brought in front of the captain of the ship who reveals that he and Doctus are part of Skentia, an anti-federation resistance group who believe that there is a relationship between the Gnosis attacks and the virtual UMN world controlled by Vector. Knowing that Gale is linked to the Lamageddon project which uses the UMN to propagate its wavelengths, the group kidnapped the Gale in order to use her to prove that there is a link between Vector and the Gnosis attacks. Concerned that her own company might be responsible for the Gnosis attacks, Xion goes to visit the girl to learn the truth. There, Skendia staff attempt to break down the girl's reality and programming in order to access her databanks. However, suddenly the girl begins to panic and starts shouting out lines being unable to fulfill her task before she's enveloped in powerful energy. Xion attempts to save the girl but is knocked out, meanwhile the girl disappears in a flash of light. By Chapter 4, Jin is back at headquarters with Xion, now in a coma with her consciousness now lost in the UMN, along with the little girls. Jin is then suddenly visited by Nephilim, who reveals that Xion and the girl are currently locked deep within a restricted part of the UMN called Aris Nova, controlled by Vector. Figuring that he has no other options, Jin flies off to meet back up with Skentia to get their help break into Aris Nova and save Xion. There, Jin is able to bargain with Doctors to make use of Skentia's elite hacking skills to break into the UMN. Chapter 5 meanwhile shows us things from Xion and the girl's perspective. They are currently locked in some kind of prison cell located in some kind of cathedral. The girl reveals to Xion that she has lost all her memories and cannot remember her own name. Suddenly a man shows up and the girl identifies him as Grimoire. Grimoire calls the girl Nephilim and offers to give the girl her memories before taking her out of the prison leaving Xion behind. Xion tries to follow the girl but is left locked in the prison. Suddenly Jin shows up and breaks Xion out. The two then follow Grimoire and the girl but are soon attacked by defense automatons. Luckily Doctors, who had also jumped into the UMN, engages the automatons allowing Xion and Jin to pursue Grimoire. On the way, Jin explains to Xion that they are currently in the UMN in a secret place known as Aris Nova. The two find Grimoire at the foot of an altar with a girl. Grimoire reveals that he is in fact the Earth-based scientist from 4,000 years ago, whose consciousness is now confined to the UMN world of Aris Nova, where he is able to accuse the information sent around the UMN. He reveals that 4,000 years ago, he tested the Lamageddon project on his own daughter, Nephilim, resulting in her consciousness being lost to the UMN. As a result, he created the girl to collect Nephilim's memory fragments from around the UMN in order to reborn Nephilim in the girl's body. Activating Lamageddon, the memories of Nephilim soon begin to flow into the girl. However, knowing that these are not her real memories, the girl begins to reject them. Grimrod doesn't understand why the girl refuses, resulting in Xion having to explain to him that the girl is not and never will be Nephilim. Suddenly, the remnants of the real Nephilim show up, much to the shock of Grimoire. Nephilim apologises for all the pain she gave Grimoire in his quest to find her. Finally achieving his goal of reuniting with Nephilim, Grimoire's consciousness finally finds peace and he's able to move on, and he disappears from the UMN. However, in Chapter 6, we see that the Glamageddon project is still active, as the girl is desperately searching for her real memories. Suddenly, the girl turns into a Gnosis and begins attacking Xion and Jin. Cosmos then suddenly shows up in a now upgraded third form after hearing Xion's cries for help from within the UMN. Together as a team, Jin and Cosmos successfully destroy the Gnosis and recover the girl from within. After rescuing the girl, Nephilim reappears and helps Xion remember when she first met the girl as a child 14 years ago. Now remembering her encounter, Xion tells the girl that her real name is Almadel. Finally with a real name, Amadeo was able to calm down and regain her composure. However, the Lamageddon project is still active and continues to summon Gnosis into the real world to attack humans. Nephilim reveals that once activated, the Lamageddon project can only be stopped at the termination of Amadeo's life. Realizing what she has to do, Amadeo begins to terminate herself from the UMN, thus ceasing to exist. Xion, realizing what's happening, begs Armadale to stop. However, Armadale explains that this is the only way, but she is still happy that Xion remembers who she really was and will hold on to those memories. And with that, Armadale disappears, causing the whole of Aris Nova to begin to collapse. Xion, who is devastated at what happens, begins to break down in tears, causing Jin to slap some sense into her to get her come to her senses and explain that Armadale had just saved their lives and dying here would not be what she wanted. Thus, Xion, Jin, and Cosmos make their escape back to the real world. 
Back in the real world, she is demoted from leading the first division at Vector for her actions in destroying Aris Nova. However, disgusted by their secrets, she and quits Vector altogether to join Skentia and discover the truths behind the Yuumen, Vector and the Gnosis. And with that, the story continues in Xenosaga Episode 3. For the most part, Xenosaga and Missing Year plays out like one long cutscene. Scenes for the most part are broken up into either image stills or self monologues. For the most part, the monologue will come from the perspective of Xion, with the exception of Chapter 4 where Jin takes over narration. While you watch the story unfold, you occasionally see certain key Xenosaga terms being highlighted in the script. These terms can then be clicked on to bring up an encyclopedia explaining the terms in detail, as seen in other games like Xenosaga DS. With the game using static imagery, pretty much all the actions are either implied through sounds or explained to us via Jin and Xion. However, there are some basic animations and a couple of scenes to give us a bit more flair in the presentation. Arguably where the presentation really excels is in the voice acting and music. While the monologue sections are voiceless, pretty much the rest of the game script is. And this includes new voice actors for Grimoire and Armadale. Alongside the voice actors, Xenosaga and Missing Year also has a complete score done by none other than Xenosaga Episode 2 and 3 composer Yuki Kajura. While a lot of these tracks are remixes of tracks from Xenosaga Episode 2 and 3, there are also a bunch of original tracks here. I don't know if these are just rejected tracks from the mainline game, but the fact that Kajuro and the sound team went through the effort of giving this Flash movie a unique soundtrack cannot be understated, even if the audio is quite compressed in order to work on 2006 internet. Heck, believe it or not, we even have an ending song. For the game's ending, we have the song In My Flong Forgotten Cloistered Sleep, sung by American singer Emily Bindiger. While quite a unique song, it's not necessarily one of my favourite Xeno ending songs. Xeno Saga 2-3 A Missing Year is definitely an interesting piece of Xeno Saga media. As a plot, it is obviously a bit on the smaller scale than those seen in the mainline games, as well as having a very small cast with it mostly pertaining to just Xion Jin and Armadale. However, it is still a very intriguing plot which sheds light both on the identity of Nephilim as well as the reason behind Earth's transformation into the land of Lost Jerusalem. To be honest, it kind of sucks that this wasn't part of a mainline Xenosaga game, as I would have loved to have explored places like Aris Nova in a full 3D environment. Not only was Xenosaga and Missing Year a pretty solid story in its own right, it was also an arguably brilliant piece of promotional material for the upcoming Xenosaga 3. I myself was pretty keen to dive right back into Xenosaga Episode 3 after playing this game, so in some respects Xenosaga and Missing Year was a pretty good project. If you haven't had the chance yet, I implore you to check out the YouTube videos of the English translation. While it's not necessarily the greatest piece of Xeno story out there, it's by far the easiest to check out as you don't need to buy any games, download any emulators, or sign away 10 hours of your life to watch a cutscene compilation. And with that, I am done with the Xeno Saga spin-off games. I'm kind of running out of Xeno Media to cover here, however I've still got Xenoblade Chronicles 3 and Future Redeemed to cover on this channel, and I also want to cover the Xeno Saga anime, so stay tuned for those videos in the near future. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the Xeno series more obscure games, and will stay tuned for my next video.